Happy New Year! We are extremely excited to see each and every single one of you here this morning. This morning we continue to worship God together in song and in music as well as continue through our study in Romans together. We are excited for that and we can't wait to hear what our senior pastor has to teach us today. But before we get there, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all our visitors. If this is your first time here at Calvary Chapel, we are extremely glad that you're able to join us here. We really, really love guests here and we would love you to continue in fellowship with us. We have a visitor's table set up at the back of the church specifically for you where you could go meet a deacon or a servant team member and they could tell you everything you need to know about our church, what we stand for, what we believe in and all the things that are important for you as you continue in fellowship with us. And most importantly, we as a church will also get to know more about you. So stick around, don't be quick to leave after the service, pass by the visitor's table at the back of the church. Now, let's get into the announcements. As the year has officially begun, we have also resumed all our ministries. Whether it's the men's ministry, Iron Sharpens Iron, the women's ministry, Wisdom for Women, and the young adults ministry, they're officially resumed. This Saturday on the 14th, we're going to be having our Iron Sharpens Iron meeting here at Calvary Chapel from 8 a.m. We encourage all the men for us to attend this wonderful meeting as they get to learn from other men and also exhort each other unto good works. So men, feel free to attend the Iron Sharpens Iron meeting this Saturday. Every Friday, the Young Adults Ministry usually meet here at Calvary Chapel from 6 p.m. So feel free as a young adult to pop us to attend. They are also interestingly going through the Book of Romans. So feel free to attend whether it's Friday or the Iron Sharpens Iron meeting on Saturday and also our Sunday morning services. Here at Calvary Chapel, we usually have baby dedications every first Sunday of the month. But because last Sunday we were having a special service celebrating our 11th year anniversary, we were unable to have baby dedications. So this Sunday, we're going to have all our baby dedications. So feel free to sign up at the back of the church or also just to have a spontaneous baby dedication during the third service. And lastly, our School of Ministry is officially back. We are extremely excited to invite each and every single one of you who is interested to learn proper theology or eschatology to feel free to attend our School of Ministry. Our School of Ministry will be going through a 12-week study where we start a course studying through Calvary Distinctives, which is based on a book written by Chuck Smith, who is the founder of the Calvary Chapel Movement. In this course, we get to go through all the fundamentals and distinctives of Calvary Chapel Movement so that as you continue with us, you know exactly what our theology is. This course is open to both members and non-members and it is a certified course. So at the end of the course, you will receive a certificate for going through this course. We invite each and every single one of you. We'll be officially having those classes every Tuesday from 6 p.m. So feel free to attend. It's open for both men and women. The sign-up sheet is available on the connection table at the back of the church. Feel free. We love to see you on Tuesday. Karibuni sana. With that, I'd like to leave you. Have a wonderful Sunday morning and a great year ahead. As we start this year off, we'd like to welcome our senior pastor, Pastor Josh Lawrence, as he teaches us from the Book of Romans. Grace and peace to you, church. Well, Happy New Year. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, please? We... Um, do want to encourage you to please, if you are able, starting from this Tuesday, that's two days from now, to sign up for this 12-week course um, that is the Calvary Distinctives book. And if you're, if you're completely unable to do it, don't do it if you can only do five weeks. But from 6 p.m. on Tuesday, um, this course that, that's going to be every Tuesday for 12 weeks, it's, it's very good. We, you know, Jordan, um, who's just visited us, he'll be teaching the course from the U.S. He's come from the U.S. to do ministries like this. And if you, any of you have ever asked, where is Calvary Chapel from? Um, we are, uh, well, it started in the U.S., uh, really God poured out His Spirit and there was a revival, the Jesus movement, really it was a ministry unto the least of these, uh, drug addicts, hippies, prostitutes, um, you know, just 
accepting once again every couple hundred years there needs to be revival because so many churches get so stuck up and think that we can't really minister to people uh, with tattoos or, you know, I remember years ago, um, there was a young university student who came to our church in town and she said, do you, she was wearing trousers, ladies' trousers, okay, there is a difference between ladies' trousers and men's trousers, gentlemen. Um, it's like the jeans are getting skinnier and skinnier on guys, just, it's, it's not cool. And, and so she came up and she, she said, do you allow women to wear trousers in the church? And my wife was over there wearing trousers. And I had to know what she's talking about. I said, well, you need to tell me the story of what you're speaking of because there seems like there's a history here. And she said that she was struggling in university. She was backslidden. She wasn't following the God that she grew up with. Um, and, uh, you know, her mom had taken her to church, and, and she did become one of our members. This was my first encounter, and she said that uh, she went because she was very broken. A lot of things were happening in university, and she was struggling, and she wanted to attend a CU service, a Christian union service, which I just have to throw in there is not a church. Okay, so... And if you know what I mean is, I believe the CU movement is wrong in meeting on Sundays. I, need, I, I believe they need to disperse and, and, and be faithful to a legitimate New Testament church. So the CU movement in the universities in Kenya has done many great things. But nevertheless, there's a bunch of kids gathering together and young people, I should say, uh, having church on Sundays and it's not a church. That just came to my mind. That's free for this morning. But anyway, she went into a CU service and she was wearing trousers and the person who was preaching said, stopped her preaching because she came in a bit late and said, Satan has come into the church because women are wearing trousers in services. Obviously, she was talking about that girl and it really was very embarrassing for her. And so... All that to say is this Calvary movement, it was like this in the U.S. You know, you have to wear a suit. There has to be certain protocols. And there was a group of people, namely Chuck Smith and his wife, Kay Smith, and a gentleman by the name of Lonnie Frisbee. They went in to the beaches in California, began to share the gospel. And in a two-year period, 30,000 people got saved and baptized in the ocean there. And Chuck Smith wrote a book because many churches have started. We are not um, the only uh, movement in the world that is part of God. There is many great churches around the world. But this course is going to teach you what is some of our distinctives. Because most of you are members here. And um, our greatest distinctive would be that we go through the Bible, verse by verse and book by book. And it's very important to us that each church that calls itself a Calvary puts a greater emphasis or the, the emphasis on scriptures over um, the pastor's ability to just teach extemporaneously or whatever he wants to preach. So sign up for the class if you can, and it'll be fruitful. And we all love certificates. So if you complete the course, you'll get a certificate. In Romans chapter 1, we left off in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, where Paul says, for I am not ashamed to preach, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Before we discuss this, and we'll really get down to verse uh, 26, 27 today, before we're done with this particular service, I want to do some reviews. It's very important. Many of you are out of town. Still, we got people coming in through these holiday breaks, and I hope you had a fruitful time with your families. Paul mentions a bunch in these first 15 verses, two things that I believe are very important that we need to discuss briefly once again. One is there in verse 10, where Paul says that 
um, making request, if by some means I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Paul is speaking to the Romans about coming to the largest city on earth, the a world empire, the, the powerful world empire at the time was Rome. And Paul wanted to go there to do ministry. He wanted to go there and preach. Now, Paul is writing the Romans. He's writing the Christians in Rome. So evidently, and most assuredly, there was already a church in Rome. Some have speculated but most agree that the church in Rome began by those who were saved on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, where they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in tongues, which was uh, at that particular occasion a known language to many of the languages, though those people speaking in tongues were not educated in that language. And 3,000 people get born again after the apostle Peter preaches. And they got baptized. And they go out. And it was the time where people from all around the world would come to Jerusalem and at that time there was different foreigners in the city and they went back home. Some of them who got born again went back to Rome and started a church. And so there's this church in Rome and the church in Rome also wasn't just some small movement but there were several in fact, maybe even thousands and thousands of Christians in Rome because at this time there was such per persecution and the center, the, the, the epicenter of the persecution was in Rome where these emperors, these Roman Caesars, um, like Nero and different, even Caesar himself, were killing Christians by the thousands. And so there was a very healthy, strong movement in Rome. And Paul's writing to them, but not only that, Paul, he is saying that I am trying to find a way in the will of God to come to you. This is very important for us because when, uh, if I had to give the top five questions that I've been asked in the last 14, 15 years of full-time ministry, on that list, on that top five list is, what is the will of God for my life? So many people ask me that. I, I don't know if I'm supposed to go into this vocation or to marry this person or to, even after they have families, move to this location and, and I'm not hearing from God and, and I've been praying and I just don't know what to do. What is the will of God? Or some people, that is somebody who's unsure about the will of God. There are others who are so, I, I, I could say, uh, dogmatic about the subjective will of God. That is what's not revealed in the word. An example of that is there are certain men, it's predominantly men, some women do this, but it's more so men, that will go up to the woman that they like, who they want to marry, and they say, listen, I was praying, and God told me that you are to be my wife. Ladies, have you ever heard that? Yeah, yeah we got some of you. It's, it's. Now, that, that is very pushy. That's very dogmatic. Of course, um, there are some women who get scared by this. They're like, oh my gosh, he prayed. He prayed. <laughs> I, he prayed. God, is this true? Am I supposed to do this? Because I don't like that guy. He, he, he never brushes his teeth. He doesn't care about me. I don't like that guy. And so we can be confused in this area of what is the will of God for our lives. And by the way, ladies, if a guy ever says that to you, that's a problem already. And, and, and you have full permission from this pastor to say, well, God didn't tell me you're to be my husband, so forget about it. 
And then again, even that is going to be a little bit contradictory than what I'm about to tell you. And we learn this from when Paul says in this verse 10 that I'm trying to find a way in the will of God to come to you. Understand that in the book of Acts, and Paul mentions it, um, that God had told him that I am going to send you, that you'll be in Rome. He's given him the revelation that is not, that is within scripture now, the canonized scripture, so we can objectively look at it. This is in the Bible that God says to Paul, you're going to Rome. Don't worry about it. So Paul, who is a great man of faith, listen, all great men of faith, Hudson Taylor said, or great women of faith have been very weak people. It is a mistake for us to look at the Apostle Paul as a person who has such faith that his kind of faith is unattainable. It's not unattainable. Though Paul has great faith, we need to understand it is God who sustains Paul. It's God who strengthens Paul. And it is not some greatness of Paul, of his own strength, his own abilities, his own intellect that allowed him to do the kind of ministry that he did. It was he was a man of faith. He believed God. I cannot tell you. It is hardwired in men to be believed in. We bear the image of God. We're going to talk about it briefly at the end of this message. And then also women bear the image of God. They desire a a, a loving, meaningful relationship. Love is predominantly a greater desire for women than it is for men. And men predominantly is a greater desire for men to be believed in. It's always hard for, for, for ladies, and I, I know I'm a guy, I'm not speaking biasly, this is the truth. When we sense that our wives doubt us. Now, there may be some legitimate reasons for our wives to doubt us at times, but just keep it to yourself, ladies, okay? Pray over it. And I'm going to leave that alone. Is Kelsey in here? But, but understand, men being in the image of God and women being in the image of God, we bear certain attributes about God. And when we put our faith in God, it pleases him. It pleases him. Folks, when we go into a situation and say, I don't care how intimidating this situation is, I don't care about the anxiety that I feel and perhaps sharing the gospel with this person or saying no to this temptation or or, or walking in this area, I'm going to believe God's word. Do you know that that is when God pours out his power? That's when God pours out his blessing. That's when God does these amazing things in his life, in our lives. And, and, and guys, I'll get, I, 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 we do tons of counseling at the church. Somebody will come in and is like, listen, my life is a mess. We're in this terrible situation, illegitimate children or, or, or this lack of th- this is going on. There's so many different examples. And I'm like, listen. God told you not to do A, B, C, D, and E, and you're doing all of them. Of course your life is a mess, unnecessarily. Now, the good news is, and we always encourage people too, is there's forgiveness as long as you repent. Start doing what's right. It's what God told Cain, right? Do what's right, and you will be what? Accepted. I'm glad you know the story of Cain. You'll be accepted if you do what's right. It's not that, oh, God is going to look down on a certain person like Paul or Billy Graham or or somebody and say, you know what? I just like the way this guy looks. I like the way this girl looks. I mean, I just like this person. Hmm. I think I'm going to bless them. Even though they're really messed up and they're filled with sin, I'm going to bless them. No. And there is a certain element that God's blessing is on the the just and the unjust. There's a general type of blessing. But the kind of blessing I'm talking about is when those people say, you know what, God, I don't understand this right now. 
I, I'm confused by your will. I know what your will is. You don't want me in this relationship or you don't want me to move in this area because your word tells me not to do this at this time or whatever the case may be. And it's hard. It's difficult, guys. I get it. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. We all go through terrible things. We all have gone through pain. But those whom God really uses are those in their confusion, in their pain, in their lives where they are so tempted to do something God doesn't want to do. And when they throw up their hands and say, I surrender. I'm going to do what you want even though I don't understand it. There's one example, and I know I've used this before, and some people may be offended by this because you're not supposed to talk about these things at church, I guess. But, but sexual intimacy is a deep part of humanity, and it is a good thing within marriage. Amen. Okay. I know this is awkward for people. I don't know why. It's not for me, and I'm on stage. So there was a guy who was preaching, a guy I respect very deeply. In fact, was part of the Jesus movement. His name is Don McClure, and he was preaching. And he said when he came to of age where he started having those desires, and, and, and I mean, guys, this comes at a young age, you know, years and years and years before we get married. And he was coming to this crossroad because he was born again at that age of 14 and 15 where all these desires came upon him. And he said, he thought of it like God, like what God was doing to him what him and his friends used to do to flies. They would take a fly, they would rip apart its wings, but it wouldn't kill the fly, and they would just watch the fly being tortured, buzzing around on the ground. That's what his friends were doing. He said, that was what God was doing to me. He's given me these desires. He's given me these wings. I I desire these things. And he's ripped them apart and he told me not to do them until years down the road. And he was upset and he said, God, he was praying. He said, God, God spoke to him and said, if you will trust me, I know you don't understand this. I know you're tempted by this, but if you will trust me and you will obey me in this, Everything else in terms of obedience will be easier for you the rest of your life. When you begin to disobey God now, not walking faith, which is the subject, it is going to be so much easier for you to continually walk away from faith. If you start today by obeying God in faith and saying, God, I don't get it. This is painful. This come and stay relationship, it has to end. This situation, I have to stop. I can no longer be a bartender at TMT. This has to stop. I am not going to move forward in this abortion. I am going to repent. Guys, I am here to tell you right now. I know it may be difficult. I know you're facing family pressures. Or you may say, I am going to go ahead and get married no matter if I have a car and a house like my parents want me to. When you walk in faith, you're going to see amazing things happen in your life. You're going to see it. You might as well all clap. It's awkward at this point. Just Listen, the Apostle Paul was told by God he's going to Rome. And he is sitting there finding a way in the will of God. He's walking in faith. Guys, he gets on a ship as a prisoner. The, sh- you know, the, 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 the storm is so big. He's like, don't worry about it. I've already been promised I'm going to Rome. They, they're shipwrecked. They go to the island of Mo- uh, um, Patmos. I said Malta in the first service, I think. And he's there. He's a servant leader, so he's not sitting in a chair that's padded that looks like a throne here in Africa. He starts getting wood. And he's going to make a fire so all these people who are cold from the ocean now can get warm. And what happens to him? A snake latches onto his his hand. And what does he do? Does he start crying? He's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. This is terrible. No, he was told by God that he's going to Rome. 
not in a, not in a casket that he's going to Rome to preach. So he shakes off the snake. What kind of faith does this guy have? But the point is this, he was finding a way in the will of God on what was already revealed to him. This is very important. God has revealed to you his will through his word. And then he's given you great freedom in choosing and you having a free will within the boundaries of his word. Because this is such a prevalent issue, let me continue to say it, marriage being one of them. And you sit there and you're like, God, who am I supposed to marry? It's like, listen, if you're a man, it has to be a woman. If you're a woman, it has to be a man. All right, let's get that out of the way. It, it, they have to be Christian. If you're born again, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Don't marry a non-Christian. And wisdom would suggest also that they're adults and there's, there's a lot of implications here, but also that they have fruit that demonstrates they're truly Christian. Ladies, don't be deceived by guys who are just raising their hands in church. And guys, don't be deceived by women who are just raising their hands in church. They could be a part of a very religious thing rather than having a relationship with Christ. But guess what? The list isn't too big. You combine those things and you say, and you know what God's saying is? I'm giving you freedom. Go pick somebody. Now, there's multitude of counsel, there's wisdom, there's all kinds of things, but listen, don't get all hung up. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The idea is, when you delight yourself in his will that is revealed through his word, then, you, then he'll say like, listen, there's options for you. I, I'm not saying God doesn't speak to us specifically about certain things he does. But guys, that is incredibly, be careful with that. There are a lot of people like, God spoke to me that there's going to be an offering given today that will buy me a Prado. Now listen, I'm not saying if you work hard and you make a lot of money that Prados are evil. Those are fine. I'm just saying there's been a lot of pastors who heard a subjective word from the Lord that the congregation is to buy him a Prado. God spoke to me. And they, they always deviate from God's word. This is way better than the collective minds of all of the preachers of all time who separate themselves from God's word. This, this is it. Paul was told by God he's going to Rome and he believed God. God also gives him freedom. He's like, listen, I'm looking. What Paul is doing is looking for open doors. Lord, I want to minister in in, in Alderet, Kenya. That was my desire. I didn't hear. I didn't see the clouds written out. Josh, you're going to go to Alderet. You, you know what I saw? I saw Matthew 28, go into all the world, making disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son. And I went, first things first, I got permission from my pastor. I believe in spiritual authority. And, and he said, yeah, you can go to Alderet, start a church. I'm like, good. What's next? It's like... I don't know what to do. We didn't have a lot of money. It's just, well, the plane ticket is this much. I'm going to get on the plane and we're going. Guys, it was a step of faith. God blessed it. And, and some of you have experienced great blessings. The point is God has given freedom to you to give you the desires of your heart as long as the desires of your heart is to obey his word. You want to marry somebody? Are they a Christian? Have they born fruit of a Christian? Or are they of the opposite sex? Are they an adult? Good. Just go marry them. And, and this is just an example of so many things. So that's, that's, that's that, finding a way in the will again. And then Paul says here that... I am a debtor both to Greeks there in verse 14 and barbarians both to wise and unwise so as much as in me I'm ready to preach the gospel in Rome also. Listen guys. There are two ways that we can be in debt. One way is that somebody gives you either something that you need to give back or a loan or, or they give you money and you owe them back. 
That's one way of being in debt. Then there's third party debt. That is somebody who says, I am giving you this money or I'm giving you this resource to go to give to this person. And so we are responsible not to consume that resource on ourselves, but to go give that money or resource that was given to us from somebody else to go give to that person. That is the debt that the Apostle Paul is referring to here. He, and he goes on and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith that is written, the just shall live by faith. He said, I, I'm not ashamed. I've been given the gospel. I've been saved by the gospel, but I am responsible both to wise, that's the Jews, to the Greeks, that's so-called high society, both to the barbarians, low society. He is responsible for the entire human race. He owes them the gospel. He owes them the gospel. Paul is revealing something, not that just he owes these people, but he's revealing to all Christians of all time that God has entrusted you and I with the gospel and we owe every single person in our lives that resource, that spoken gospel. We owe it to them. In 2 Kings chapter 7, a very interesting story. It's a true story. These four lepers, they're outside the camp of, uh, of Samaria, this city in uh, Israel. And the Syrians surround the, the city and they are starving them out. They are cutting off the supply chain of food. And so all the people in the city are starving and not even the scraps that are being thrown over the city walls, which the lepers are eating, are eating. And the lepers are these four guys in 2 Kings chapter 7. These four lepers say, hey, we're, we're going to die. We're going to die here because we have no food. If we go into Samaria, they're going to kill us because we're not allowed in the city. But... We are not aware of what the Syrians may do to us. Maybe we go into their camp and they kill us, which we're already going to die, so that doesn't matter. Um, but maybe we go in and they actually receive us and they give us food and we survive. So these four lepers decide that they're going to go into the camp of the Syrians. When they get there... The entire Syrian army is gone. The tents are filled with food, with gold, with silver. The tents are there so they have covering. And these four, and it, the Bible tells us what happened that when these lepers are approaching, God made it sound like there was chariots and this powerful army and they are filled with fear and they flee. And it was only four people. It's only four. I mean, probably these lepers, their bones are cracking. It's like, uh, you know, they're in pain. And God made it sound like in the ears of these people that there's an army because God's in control. They get there and it's empty. So these guys start eating the food. They start taking the gold and the silver and they start hiding it and burying it. And then you know what they said to one another? They said, this is wrong that we're doing this. We have an entire camp filled with gold and food and silver and our countrymen are starving to death. And then they said, the Bible says, we need to go tell them this good News, that same word for the gospel, which means good news. Paul, in Romans 1, this leprous, scabby, murderous sinner gets born again, and God provides for him these resources of food and gold and silver, metaphorically speaking. And he says, not only is this for you, but understand, it is wrong for you not to go share this gospel with everyone you know. You owe that to them. Guys, it is not simply 
a suggestion that we are in a constant state of having the name of Christ on our lips, which Christ is the gospel, but it is an absolute command. And beyond the command, you are in debt. You owe people the resources that you have so thoroughly enjoyed, which is the gospel. That's what Paul's saying. I'm in debt to everyone. This resource of the gospel, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is better with the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith. Paul's not only talking about the faith into salvation, he's talking about the faith to preach the gospel. He's talking about the faith to go to Rome. He's talking about the faith to walk in the promises of God. You may say, oh, Pastor Josh, I don't know if you are aware of my workplace environment. There's an, there's an atheist who is my boss. He hates the gospel. There is a a professor who is my boss, he hates the Bible. There is a Muslim who is my boss and he will fire me if I preach this gospel. You don't know the environment. I can't go just preaching Christ. You know what they were doing to the Christians in Rome? They were dipping them in tar and in wax They were tying them to poles, kind of like these poles. And they were lighting them on fire when they were having their orgies and parties. And they were in a drunken state looking up at the Christians saying, you are the light of the world, watching them burn to death. I think Paul's environment was a little worse than ours. And he's going and he's not ashamed. He's not ashamed. He's he's walking in faith. He's walking in power. He's walking in strength. You know what they did to God to the Apostle Paul in Rome, don't you? They chopped his head off. Clean off. And nevertheless, do you know how many people got born again? We don't even know how many people got born again during Paul's preaching ministry in, 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 in Rome. We are in debt to every single person around us to make sure they get the good news that we have experienced. You must go preach the gospel. It goes on to say, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. I'm going to read Um, a lot of this, maybe even to the end of the chapter so we get get a context. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation Of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and in their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their woman exchanged the natural use for what is against the nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, 
and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness and sexual immorality and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness, full of envy and murder and strife, deceit, even mindfulness and whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who do them. Now, we're not going to get all that. We will maybe next Sunday. But we needed to get the context of what's happened. It says at the beginning of this section, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. There are four kinds of God's wrath. Four demonstrations of his wrath in the Bible. Number one, you have consequential wrath. That is, God has demonstrated, well, first God has created us, which is a huge part of what he's talking about here, which we'll get into more next week, being the imagio deo, that is, we are in the image of God. And, and, and he has recreated us, and, and, and his, his image is upon us. That is a moral consciousness, but we fall. But still, because we're in his image, sin destroys the world. His nature is revealed to us through his law and through his word. And when we violate his word, when we're disobedient, when we violate his nature, there are consequences for us. That's consequential wrath. It's this natural wrath. If you go have envy in your heart and bitterness... You're going to even lose friends because most people are not going to want to be around somebody who's always hateful and bitter and resentful and unjoyful. That's a consequence. There's even more severe consequences. There's actually two kinds of consequences mentioned in this portion of Scripture. One is predominant, and then the other is just minor. It mentions that they received within themselves the penalty of their error. It's talking about homosexuality and lesbianism. These homosexual men have a very high rate of sexual transmitted disease, especially AIDS. And then they spread this throughout uh, women with women, men with men. That is also a consequential wrath. Um, STDs, illegitimate children. It's painful having a children, though they are a blessing to us when they don't have fathers and mothers. That's consequential wrath. There's also number two, cataclysmic wrath. That is, God allows earthquakes and tsunamis and hurricanes and tornadoes and all these things to cause these, these cataclysmic events. And, and it is a form of God's judgment. It's a form of God's wrath. Is he always the one personally causing an earthquake? Not necessarily either way, but he definitely allows things to happen. He could stop them. People die, but he allows things to happen. See, an example of Sodom and Gomorrah would be God, he is the one who caused that cataclysmic event. He poured out his wrath on that city. And then there's the other kind of cataclysmic event where he allows these things to happen without stopping them. We know through the revealed word there are certain cataclysmic events that he caused. And then others we can't understand. I mean, have you guys saw the news on some of these storms in America that's happening in Buffalo, New York, or Seattle? Dozens and dozens of people are dead because of these snow and ice storms. So many people. That is a cataclysmic wrath. Guys, and some of these regions where this are happening are terrible regions. They're like Sodom and Gomorrah. You, sh you should look at some of these pictures. It looks like a, 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 a picture off the movie Frozen, the way that these buildings and these houses are completely encased in ice. There are such snow drifts that people are being boxed in in their cars in a matter of minutes and they can't get out and they die in their cars. 
Famines are cataclysmic uh, judgments. Number three, there's chronological wrath. So number one, you have consequential wrath. Number two, cataclysmic wrath. Number three, you have uh, um, uh, chronological. That is eschatological. What that means is the Bible has predicted an end times wrath. That is, all throughout the prophets of the Old Testament, the book of Revelation, God has spoken that he will pour out his wrath on the nations. He will destroy the world's governments and he will set up a government that is ruled under him that is in righteousness and peace and joy and all those wonderful things. But before he establishes this government, he must destroy the world. None of those are the wraths that God is speaking about here. This is the fourth kind of wrath. This is the judgment of abandonment. God is abandoning in this case. In fact, three different occasions, it says, he gave them over. He gave them over. He gave them over. He gave them over to not have him retained in their knowledge, though it speaks of a knowledge they do have, which will be the focus of next week. He gave them over to vile passions. In, in other words, you want this sexual immorality? You want this idolatry? You want this envy and strife and murder and all these different things that it mentions for us in detail here? You want vile passions? You can have them. But I can tell you what, you can't have me with it. I will give you over to it. And thirdly, he gave them over, not just to, without knowledge, not with vile passions, to a debased mind, a mind that has no ground to walk on, no foundation to walk on. He gave them over to vile passions, to debased mind, to being without knowledge of God. When I was 11 years old, I... I had heard the gospel. I had, my, my mother had taken me to different churches. They had preached the proper gospel. I had heard it. And I had this experience where I, I know now, I, and I knew then it was God, but it was the Holy Spirit really convicting me, ladies and gentlemen, and, and, and telling me to serve him, to surrender to not give in to my passions, which were vile. Even at the age of 11, I started using drugs and doing things. He says, you need to surrender. You need to not give in to these vile passions. You need to follow me. And it, it was this moment, I remember it. The Holy Spirit really came alongside of me, with me, and just said, surrender it. And I made a bargain with God. I was very deceived, but I did make a bargain. And this was the bargain, guys. I will serve you after I graduate high school, or in your case, would be Form 4. Has anybody ever made a deal with God? Oh, I'm going to do this after, after I enjoy my vile passions. It didn't work. In fact, in hindsight, I realized I did not really hear God's voice one more time for 10 years several years even after high school, when I was 21. And you know what happened? God doesn't change, he's immutable. There's no change with God. When I was 21, after I did give in to my vile passions, after I did give in to my sin, he came to me again because he's gracious, he's caring, he's loving, and he, same thing. Give up your vile passions, surrender to me, repent. I'll forgive you. And by God's grace, I got born again at the age of 21. This is the point. And I believe this to be a biblical truth. And what is revealed here, when you say no to God, he will give you over to what you chose over him. Maybe he doesn't do it forever. I think he'll give people more opportunities. But don't take that risk. Today is the day of salvation. Today is where you say, I am repenting over this sin. I will not risk 
the judgment of God. I will return to him or I will be born again. I will not deny this opportunity. It's very important that when God is speaking to us, we respond in faith and we respond in obedience. Because this fourth judgment is one of the scariest judgments of all when he just leaves us alone because we said no to him. Let's bring the worship team up. Worship team, wherever you are, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Are you running from God? He's tried to get your attention on an occasion or two. Understand something, guys. The Bible has revealed to us that God will leave you alone. And that's one of the most scariest places you could ever be. You don't want God to say to you, okay, you can have your vile passions. You can not retain me in your mind, in your knowledge. You can, you can have no foundation. I'll give them over to a debased mind. Something that has struck me recently in my devotions, do you know at the end of chapter one, we read it and we're going to talk about it. We may finish it next week. It says that those who do this are deserving of death. God is well within his right to kill the person who walks after this sin and rejects his grace of Christ on the cross. He's well within his rights. He's done it before. He's done it during the great flood. And the Bible says, do you know when he, said, he says, my, my, my spirit will not endure with man always. There was only eight people and there are some scholars who believe there was as many as eight billion people on the planet at that time, 4,000 years ago. Now, we don't know the number, but we definitely, through the process uh, uh, that we, has proven when people come together in marriage and they have children and children, over a 2,000-year period, there were millions and millions and millions and millions of people on the earth. Millions. When God told Noah the reason why he was going to kill everyone and everything, he didn't say, oh, they're just out murdering each other. Oh, they're just out in sexual immorality. Oh, no, they're just out coveting. Everybody wants what everybody else has. He didn't say that. What does he say? That the thoughts of man are continually evil always. And here in chapter 1, my Bible's not there anymore. Here in chapter 1, it says he gave them over to a debased mind. A mind with no foundation. It, it, literally, a mind without Christ. You know how offensive it is to God that we don't think about him? That humanity is so estranged and separated from him? If the Lord is speaking to you today, if you're backslidden, if you're in sin, I am telling you, repent before it's too late. And don't fall under the judgment of abandonment. He'll never abandon his children. He'll never abandon his sons and daughters. But there will come a day where he will judge people who didn't deny Christ. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes. I want to pray for those who would be born again today or who are backslidden who will come back to Christ. In just a moment, I'll have you raise your hand. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work. We have seen in your word that you will give people over to, to uh, not having knowledge. You will give people over to vile passions. You will give people over to a debased mind. But Lord, we don't want to be those people. We want to retain Christ in our knowledge. We want to have a foundation for our life that is built 
on the rock and we want to have righteous desires instead of evil temptations that we walk in. I pray you'd pour out your spirit. If there's anybody who's backslidden or who needs to be born again, I want to pray for you. Raise your hand right now and I will pray. Just lift your hand up right in your seat. I'll pray for you. Anybody who want to be born again. I see somebody back there. Another person. Anybody else? Say, I'm tired of running. I don't want this judgment of abandonment. I want to be born again. I want to follow after Christ. Anybody else? Keep your hands up as I pray for you. Lord, I pray for these people. I see four, maybe five people, Lord. I pray for you. I pray you pour out your Holy Spirit on them. I pray, Lord, that you'd forgive them and we know you will when they repent and when they ask for forgiveness. And I pray that you would bless them with the joy of righteousness. For we have a father who gave up his son. And I pray that you would save them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you rose your hand, just keep it up really high. Please raise your hand. Guys, look around and give them a hand. At least 10 or 15. Listen, if you can put your hands down. If you did raise your hand, there was many of you. Come for prayer. I'll be up here in front. We have pastors, Pastor Odoyo and Pastor Otieno and Okoth. We're going to be right here in front of the stage. Come receive uh, more prayer if you need it. Tell us about your lives. Also sign up for a, for a New Believers Bible study that we'll uh, send to you. Give us your contacts. We want to be a part of your life. Let's also pray for the offering as we uh, give to the Lord this morning. Lord, thank you for the ability to give and the privilege we have. I pray, Lord, that this wouldn't be out of compulsion like, like we have to do this and we don't want to, but we are giving because we love you and we have faith. We have faith, Lord, that you will provide for us because your word says you will. I pray you would receive our offering to expand your kingdom here on earth. Give us wisdom over it, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys stand as the ushers and deacons come forward and we'll sing, the, sing this wonderful hymn together.
Attempting to articulate the great beauty, the great magnificent person that you are. Nobody has ever done what you've done. Giving of your son, sacrifice. Why should we gain any type of reward? Not only do you save us, you pay us for working for you. Not only do you give us a job we're completely unqualified for, you pay us to do it. And the rewards that we receive at the Bema is for your glory and for the worship of the great God that we serve. And we worship you. We love you, Lord. I pray for a revival in our church that would begin in the hearts of every member. A real move where we submit to your word and obey your will. that we would be changed, that the people at our workplace would see that change, be affected by it, that our families would see the testimonies of what you're doing in our lives. And I pray that that testimony would bring you glory. I do ask this, Lord, all in Jesus' name, and everybody says amen. God bless you, church. Have a good week. Be blessed. We're going to be here in the front if anybody needs prayer. Anybody needs counsel?